Women religious in the Diocese of Fresno and in every diocese in the nation have dwindled in the past 50 years. In the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, nuns were the backbone of the Catholic community. They created and taught in the schools, nursed in the hospitals, and served the poor and needy in the cities and towns. In the 1960s, an estimated 200,000 nuns served the church throughout the nation. Today, it is estimated that only 56,000 nuns are active in the church. In the Diocese of Fresno, 125 nuns, representing 22 orders, continue their spiritual work. The vicar for the religious in the Fresno Diocese, Sister Invencion Canas, a nun since 1954, had to flee Cuba after Castro took over the country. Well, I was on formation for a few years, and after my formation years, I stayed in Spain for one year in education, getting ready for, uh, to be able to be a teacher. And after that, I was sent to Cuba. And I was in Cuba for five years. I was there during the revolution. I was a teacher there till Fidel Castro took over. We had 13 schools in Cuba and we lost all of them. So that's when we started going to different places in the world. And that's when I came here to California. We women in my congregation and in a lot of congregations who made three vows. The vow of poverty, obedience and chastity, okay? Because we made the three vows, we made three promises to God, vows. So if they send me to wherever they send me, I may say, well, I have this, but usually we obey. We go wherever they tell us to go, you know? Because we made a vow of obedience. If there is a problem, there's, let's say that they send me to a country that maybe my health won't, you know, respond, then I can talk to my superiors, but otherwise I go wherever, you know. In the 1945 movie, The Bells of St. Mary's, the iconic image of the nun was actress Ingrid Bergman, the beleaguered principal of the St. Mary's school, struggling to keep the school open in trying times. She succeeds in her efforts, but the struggles of Catholic schools to stay open in the next 50 years up to today is very real. The Fresno Diocese has 19 elementary schools and two high schools. Former teachers and principals, Sister Rosalie Rohr and Sister Kathleen Drilling, remember when. That's what I've always wanted to be, is just a teacher. When I was growing up, I started in public education. But in Merced, there's a Catholic high, uh, elementary school, Our Lady of Mercy. And I started in fourth grade, and so I had four years with um, our sisters, the Immaculate Heart Sisters in Our Lady of Mercy. And I really enjoyed those sisters very much. But I also was involved with the Franciscan Sisters of the Atonement. They used to teach catechism in our family home. And I would teach catechism for those sisters in Planade in the back, store, uh, back room of a store. But I really liked the Immaculate Heart Sisters. There was one sister in particular, Sister Doris Murphy, that's her name right now, who seemed to always have yard duty, and I used to hang around with her out in the yard. They were so educated. And um, when I left eighth grade, I went into public high school, but they built Our Lady of Mercy High School, Catholic High School, and I went back there for two years. So when everyone else in my class as seniors were graduating, all contemplating marriage, I entered the Immaculate Heart Sisters. I was just, I just enjoyed their demeanor. We used to go to their convent on Saturdays and clean the house and do all kinds of things with the sisters. I wanted to be a teacher like this teacher that I had in grade school. I wanted to be able to, to touch kids' lives and to help them learn. Uh, school was not difficult for me, but it was more of a social event. Uh, but I understood kids that had a difficult time. Um, then I came here to Fresno State and uh, I would walk from class and drop in here and go to daily mass whenever I could. And I remember uh, Father Negro saying to me one time, what is it that you really want to do with your life? And I, it, it just came out. I, would, I want to be a teacher and I want to be a sister. And he said, well, you know, you better get, get at that. <laughs> In other words, stop partying stuff, and, you know, socializing and look at the future. And that's what I did. So. I was really blessed to have um, a great shot in the arm for uh, an enforcing 
or an underscoring of my vocation, thanks to the women religious uh, that I grew up with. I think when I was um, appointed bishop, they're still scratching their head and saying, how in the world did he ever fall through the cracks? But uh, uh, in, spite of, uh, in spite of me, uh, but they did a wonderful, wonderful job of really of, of formation, and not just in myself, I feel, giving us a chance to really uh, deepen our faith life, but for many of us in my generation who uh, went to three Catholic schools when I was growing up, and they staffed all three Catholic schools in Oxnard. Medical facilities were also major areas of service in many communities that nuns created and served. St. Agnes Hospital, founded in 1929 by the Sisters of the Holy Cross, is still in operation today, but now operated by Trinity Health, but void of any administrative or medical involvement by the Sisters of the Holy Cross. Those who serve today fill a variety of duties, including hospital chaplain, director for the Center for Women, and coordinator for family life. <laughs> Sister Mary Clennon, director of the Center for Women, became a nun in 1957 and has served all over the world. Well, I think that, of course, the, the sisters, as you say, established the health care systems, and they did all the, the work in the hospitals, um, from scrubbing the floors to, you know, whatever, whoever was professional. Mm -hmm. and. Um, then gradually it has grown and grown and more communities have come over and established health care um, facilities. Mm -hmm. um, now in our society, the hospitals are no longer independent, so to speak. And um, first we merged with uh, one group and now we've merged with Catholic Health Care East. And so we're, but we're still called Trinity. So um, there have been huge changes in healthcare, and a lot has to do, first it had to do with Medicare, when Medicare came in, I think, in the 60s. Um, there was also, prior to that, the changes in medical care itself, you know, antibiotics after the uh, Second World War. All of those things have made huge changes in the way uh, medicine's practice today and as we all know people used to be in the hospital for 10 days at least maybe for an appendectomy and now you're you're lucky if you stay over a night <laughs> so um, health care has really changed a lot and there's a lot more outpatient in terms of um, clinic and these um, urgent care centers, which I think are great because hopefully it will keep more and more people out of the emergency rooms because that's, you know, very, very costly. St. Agnes Medical Center provides a medical and dental clinic at Pavarillo House and the Center for Women, serving over 500 clients a month. When I came, and I, I spent one year at the clinic and then they asked me to assume this as well, in 98 and um, we were seeing between 40 and 45 women a day but sister Chris Healy who you may know was my predecessor she was an educator and she felt that it, we shouldn't be a hand handout organization so she was the one who um, wanted the Center for Children so that when the mothers came, if they came for counseling, they came for clothing, they came, whatever they came for, whatever the needs were, they didn't need to be burdened with the children while they were here. And then she wanted this educational center. But as soon as it was completed, her health was failing. So that's why they asked me to assume the responsibility. And be, partly because of the educational center, partly because uh, we're probably a little bit better known. Um, I mean, when you think from 40 or 45 women a day to 150 average a day, that's, that's quite a leap. The wonderful, wonderful areas of um, healthcare 
Once again, my mother used to work at uh, St. John's Medical Center. And when you think straight across the board, how many of our women religious have worked in our health care, not only when I was growing up, but now again, and uh, in affiliated areas, as you and I were talking a little while ago, the outreach to the homeless community right here in Fresno, and working uh, where you were saying that at least 150 clients are served daily just in the Pavarello area with that particular section, and that's just meals. And I'm sure with the dental uh, outreach and certainly uh, medical outreach, they're reaching other families as well. Before the 70s, nuns were identified any place, any time by their dress. The habits that identified them were their order to every Catholic and non-Catholic on earth. The Second Vatican Council in the 1960s started the change from exemplary piety and strict observance of rules to political activism and restructuring the church. When you had a habit, you knew what you were wearing. And we did not have money, you know, to be able to go out and buy. I knew how to sew, so I made a, a lot of my own outfits, skirts and dresses and so forth, yes. First of all, they, you don't have to look at someone wearing a habit to know. I mean, when you, look, when you wear a habit, they know what you are. I would rather not have a habit on and by my demeanor and how I'm acting and how I am, they know what I am. There's somehow, there's, people say, well, there's a look about you. We know what you are. Now, since after Vatican Council, most of the sisters adjusted the, the, you know, the habits. But all the sisters have something that even though it's not a habit, they can tell that they are sisters. First of all, if you look at me, I have a cross that not everybody has this cross. This cross only uh, the sisters of the love of God has it. And if you look at other sisters, they have a different cross or, or different, you know, distinctive, but still you can tell that they are sisters, you know. Because to be a sister is just no, it's not just the cross, it's the way you live, you know. It's the way you live your life. I entered the order in 1967. You know, that's, that's towards the end of the, of the council. And the sisters, the religious orders were asked to update, to go back to your original charisms, to go back to uh, what was your founding purpose. And I believe sisters communities all over the world took that seriously. I know ours did. We looked at our foundress who did not adopt a habit. She dressed as the women that she was serving. Uh, took on the common woman's clothing. It got stylized, it got solidified into habits. And so when we looked at that, we said, what was she doing? She was identifying with the poor that she went to serve, the poor women who had no education, no chance of education for their daughters. And she dressed like them. And so we said, how do, how do we do that? What we say today is it must be modest, which is kind of an old-fashioned word in today's society. Modest, it must be uh, inexpensive, and it must be appropriate to the job that you're doing. And uh, so in 1974, I think that's the time where they said, you don't have to wear a veil. And uh, I, I took the veil off, and I've never put a veil back on. I do respect and reverence what that habit and veil meant to the church. Uh, but. I'm happier to just be in the world and let people know me from the inside out rather than the outside in. Fewer women in the U.S. are selecting the religious life. In the 1960s, some 7,000 women a year entered a religious order. Today, fewer than 1,000 seek the calling in over 200 orders to choose from. Most religious communities ask that you have your college education, and you have a job, at least in my community, you have a college education already under your belt, and you have a career. You're not to enter a community to be taken care of. You have to be self-confident, you need to know, you know, you need to know yourself, and you need to know where you're going. And in our case right now, we're not all teachers anymore. A lot of our people are involved in social justice um, situations, and we're not in schools anymore. See, we used to be a lot of people don't want to enter because we used to be just teachers or in hospital work. Or with our changes, that is not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So you better know what you want to do. Since Vatican II, there have been so many openings for laywomen in the church to fulfill some kind of role. In the past, the, the women that really worked in the church were religious women. So what do I see today? I see a lot of committed young women who would like to serve in the church, but it hasn't been clearly defined how they can do it. And now with this Pope saying we need a theology of women, we need to look at where we can you know, grow in that area, I think we're going to see you know, women stepping up to the plate and uh, challenging that and asking for, uh, asking for places to work and to serve. Some of our sisters get a little bit nervous. Nobody's coming in, nobody's coming in. Are we gonna die out? I don't think that is true. I think it may call for us to maybe be more welcoming to women in other roles than the vowed life. Uh, but I do think that, that women will, will, will surge to the front soon. <laughs> Our vocations are in Ghana, Uganda, India, Bangladesh, Peru, Brazil, those, Mexico. Those are where our vocations are coming from. And I think it has a lot to do with the evolution of society. You know, when I was young, women had about three choices. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a housewife, maybe a secretary. But there, there weren't the opportunities. Today, women can, young women could, maybe they want to do volunteer work someplace. They can volunteer, say like with the Jesuit volunteers and go over and spend two or three years in Africa and work, come back, pick up their profession, marry if they want to, move on. You know, uh, there are so many differences in our society especially for women today, that I think that has a lot to do with it. How can I serve the church? Well, maybe I don't have to uh, take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but I, I just choose to remain single, but I want to work in the area of social work. And so they're entering into lay uh, ecclesial services and secular ways of serving the church, but living the lifestyle of um, women who are taking private vows to the bishop, and uh, but they have a job in whether they're social workers or they're in secular institutes that we write. I just talked with a, with a woman uh, who is from Africa working in the Bakersfield area, and she's the only woman religious that I know uh, from the, from, um, the secular institute that we have in the diocese. So I was pleased to see that she's, her focus is really in marriage counseling. And, and I'm thinking, what a wonderful, wonderful gift. And if this is the area that other women are going to be offering their, their services, I think it's a very healthy way. Uh, it's just the changing face of uh, religious life, I think, in the United States. Nuns are directed by their order to serve in the various parts of the nation and the world with the blessing of the bishop of the diocese they serve in. Their order can relocate them at any time. A nun has to be a strong woman, independent, adventurous, self-reliant, with a strong belief in her faith. After 2008, I started another chapter in my life. I decided to do a lot more at the cathedral. I'm there every single day. And when I'm not there, I'm here at the chancery office. And I became co-editor with Father Rood four years ago now uh, with the Catholic Life. And I also work on the diocesan directory in the Kennedy Report here. And anything else that the chancery office would like me to do. It's not an easy life because, you know, the world doesn't understand why someone would actually choose this life. And so all along you're, you're, you're always, well, 
what about, can you be fulfilled without being married or without having children? The one thing I've come to understand being in Fresno for so long and teaching in Fresno for so long, I have a lot of children. I, I just happen to meet them at different levels. And that is a wonderful thing because you, you see them in their lives progressing forward. Um, you do have to be kind of independent. And you're living in a house, even when I lived in, in a convent with a number of sisters. <laughs> If you had a leaky faucet or something like that, you learned how to fix it yourself. I went to a one-room school for eight years and then um, entered the community. It, there, were a, there were a lot of young people when I entered, you know, but many of them, of course, have left. Um, and then, you know, traveled around this country even before going overseas. So. It, it's been um, it's been a wonderful adventure for me personally, and I hope it's been a help to the people that we serve. I just encourage everybody, you know, that God is calling, and, and you know, we have to open our eyes and our heart and see what God wants from each one of us. You know, there are a lot of people that are afraid to become a sister or to be a priest, but I could tell them that I wouldn't change my life for anything in the world. You know, I was very young when I entered and I don't regret a single day. I'm a very happy person, and you know, I think um, I'm in love with God. <laughs>